Yeah, my name is uh, Ramez Nam. I've been a computer scientist most of my life. I spent 13 years working at Microsoft. I'm a full-time writer right now. I write both uh, non-fiction about science and science fiction. I'm a fellow of the IEET, which means that I write, I blog for them periodically about topics about the ethics of emerging technologies. How should we think about emerging technologies? What do they mean to us? Uh, I spent a long time there, 13 years. I was in management. I led teams working on email, also Outlook, Internet Explorer, and the Bing search engines. Lots of work with neural networks, AI, tens of thousands of machines at a time. Lots of very fun stuff. Yeah, so the book is called Nexus, and it's a book about a uh, drug that you take that's actually a nanotechnology that implants in your brain and connects people's brains wirelessly over radio waves. It kind of produces a weak telepathy, and my protagonists have uh, uh, been working on advancing it, extending the range, building apps on top of it, that sort of thing. And it's in a world that's been scarred by misuse of biotech and nanotech. Uh, so there's a lot of crackdown in this technology. Uh, so they're busted, and then it gets into kind of international espionage and politics. Uh, it's a thriller. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, the underlying theme, really, there's a, an, a high-level theme that is the technology and the, the cool things you can do with it and the thriller aspect of it. But underneath that, there's a question of civil liberties, of who gets to decide what you put in your brain, who decides who's human and who isn't, what kind of powers we want government to have versus individuals. Uh, and I really want people to come out of it feeling like they want more of the power in their own hands and less to be told what it is they should be doing. We're already parts of group minds. Uh, anytime you're in a relationship or in a corporation or in an organization or in a country or in a religion, any of those, those are effectively group minds that are aggregating the collective intelligence uh, of those individuals. So yeah, we're part of that now. Uh, language is one of the ways that we send signals back and forth between the nodes, the group minds. Market activity is another, and we'll get better and better at that over time. And that's really about uh, the planet and our role on it and human civilization. So we face a lot of large challenges climate change, finite fossil fuels, freshwater depletion, all of these things. Are we doomed from that? Um, are they really not challenges at all? How do we overcome them? So it's a book about how innovation has helped us overcome similar problems in the past and what we need to do now to maximize our odds of doing so again. Sure, time and time again, we have run up against some sort of resource limitation that has looked very, very, very scary and largely we've overcome those by innovating in some way. So many examples. 1968, a fellow named Paul Ehrlich, who's still quite famous, uh, wrote a book called The Population Bomb, where he said the battle to feed humanity is over, but that billions would die of starvation in the coming decades. Well, actually, the death rate from starvation, the hunger rate have both plummeted over time. Population has more than doubled since he wrote that book, but food supply has risen faster. And it's risen faster, not because we farm more land, but because we've increased yields. A guy named Norman Borlaug, who won the Nobel Prize, was, at the time that Ehrlich wrote that book, was breeding new wheat strains that could grow twice a year, that devoted more of their energy to the edible kernel and less of the stock, and so on. So that's one form of innovation. And if we look over the 10,000 year history of civilization, we've actually increased the number of people you can feed with one acre by about a factor of 10,000, which is really remarkable. Uh, if you look at other numbers, the amount of energy it takes per ton of steel produced has gone down by a factor of five since 1950. Uh, the amount of light you produce with one unit of energy has gone up by about a factor of 500 between candles and LEDs. These are all situations where new ideas, new scientific insights, new engineering insights have maximized or multiplied the value that we get out of natural resources, or reduce our footprint, reduce our consumption if we had to. Absolutely. Scarcity is a big driver of adversity. There's new data now from past analysis of temperatures and rainfalls that show that in China over a thousand year period, when it got uh, colder and drier, 
Uh, there were more revolutions, more downfalls of empires, and so on. Uh, the conflict we hear about in Darfur, in Sudan, a lot of that was caused by drought that led nomadic people to leave their current lands and push into an area where there were already farmers occupying the land, and that brought them into conflict. So if we want to avoid more conflicts in the future, the best thing we can do is increase the size of the resource pie so that people aren't suffering in scarcity, because that scarcity will lead to more conflict. So More Than Human is a book about the actual science of enhancing human beings, so making us longer lived, smarter, more athletic, uh, more able to control our own personalities and appearances, and ultimately interfacing us with machines as well. It's about two-thirds of the science and about one-third about the economics, the ethics, the policy side. And really what I wanted people to take away from that is this sort of thing is possible. On the near future, it's not fiction anymore, on the near future we'll be able to make people smarter than they were, say, or long, more longer lived than they were. Um, and we should think about it, and that the best way to do that in a way that uh, makes society better rather than worse is to leave the decisions about that mostly in the hands of individuals and families. Democratic but respecting uh, individual liberty. Uh, in a democracy you could make a law that says that so-and-so can't do this. But it's really more about civil rights, it's about self-ownership um, and the ability of people to make choices for themselves. Well, great strides are already happening. Uh, I have contact lenses. Some people have LASIK. Uh, women use the birth control pill, which is a, a revolution 50 years ago. Uh, I have an iPhone. I mean, those are all science fiction technologies. So we're already enhancing ourselves. And yes, absolutely, there are more great strides ahead. I think there are two areas that I think are going to be uh, most interesting to watch. One, technologies aimed at um, replacing our use of fossil fuels and moving us to a place where we can keep growing the economy, keep growing wealth and reducing poverty, but doing so in a way that doesn't damage the planet. That's a very big technology area maybe not so relevant to transhumanism. Uh, the second is uh, the technologies that affect our genes and especially our brains. Uh, there's a lot of strides we're making in genetics now that we have genome sequencing costs low enough that we can sequence hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of genomes. We can start to pull out more of the data about what genes actually cause what effects or what combinations of genes cause what effects. The technology of editing the genome in the living, living human being is just as important. Knowing is only half the battle, and able to make a change as well. And that's lagging behind right now, but that's a, a crucial bottleneck. If we get to the point where we can reliably make changes in the genes of cells inside living people, that will open the floodgates to huge advances. And then finally, most of who we are really, what we care about is what happens inside of our brains. That's where everything we care about really uh, comes down to. And there's a lot of work happening in neuroscience, mostly aimed at helping people who have been uh, harmed or damaged in some way, who've been injured, who've lost their sight, lost their hearing, who've been paralyzed. Uh, for all of those reasons, we're working on systems that interface directly with the brain to get information in and out. And that, in a lot of ways, is the final frontier. Well, we've already changed our genes a lot. Civilization has changed us. We've had a burst of evolution over the last few thousand years as we've uh, civilized and changed this lot of pressures. Um, but of course, people are going to want to edit their genes and the genes of their children for obvious reasons. If you know that you're a carrier for a, a gene that increases the risk of cancer and you're having a child, you don't want to pass that on. Uh, if you know that you're a carrier for a gene that causes Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or increases the odds of those, you want to pass that on. And then we get more of a slippery slope after that. What about obesity? You know, obesity comes with lots of health challenges, but it's also cosmetic. So, of course, you'd like to reduce the likelihood of that. Uh, what about some degree of intelligence? You know, boosting your child's intelligence, maybe just a little bit here and there, if it's possible to do in a safe way, is good for the child. It's also good for society. I would say. So people are going to want to do these things for the obvious reason that parents care about their kids. And mostly those changes are going to be beneficial for the rest of us, I think.
Well, I think it's all the topics that I just talked about, but extended. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the next 10 years, science moves also slowly sometimes, especially when it comes to medical science, because even after you have a discovery, you have a very long period of going through clinical trials to deem it safe. So if we look at what's going to be actually on the market 10 years from now, well, it's almost entirely things that are in trials already. And those are not uh, dramatic steps in most cases. So there's a few, like uh, the retinal prosthesis that restores vision from blindness. That will be fully approved by then. But mostly the things that are, that are in trials now don't look life-changing. But 40 to 100 years from now, you do have the possibility of substantial progress against aging, the possibility of even reversing aging. You have the possibility of brain-computer interfaces that don't just restore sight, but maybe allow us to send mental imagery back and forth between people, maybe allow us to share emotions directly between people, or even share concepts, accelerate learning, uh, possible substantial increases in the rate at which people can learn things via other means, uh, drug mechanisms and genetic mechanisms. There's a lot of interesting stuff. And of course, though, in some ways, the biggest one is uh, can we take human consciousness out of the brain and copy it into a digital system, into a computer. Uh, and that, you know, nobody really knows how far away that is. You hear quotes, Ray Kurzweil, 2045, but to pretend that we know exactly uh, what level of computational difficulty is required to simulate the brain is to assume that, that our knowledge of how the brain works is perfect now. And undoubtedly, as with most engineering projects, we're gonna find out that there are things that we missed. So it might be 60, 70, 80, 100 years before we get that, it might even be longer than that. Uh, but that is certainly something we're going to work towards over that time, and we'll see big strides in that time frame. Everything about the future excites me. I mean, it's, it's the place we're all going. So uh, it pains me that people don't think about it more, actually. Uh, but for me, as I said earlier, we live inside of our brains. We live inside of our minds. And the most exciting thing about the future to me are those technologies that allow us to uh, manipulate our own minds. What if I could be smarter? What if I could learn to play piano in a period of hours or days? What if I could learn a new language that I hadn't learned before in a period of, of hours or days, or even less than that, perhaps? What if I could actually uh, feel what you're feeling right now, and you could feel what I'm feeling right now? What if I could, instead of painting a picture for you with words, actually show you what I saw? Uh, that's very personally exciting to me, as far as what that could be like, and I think it's also potentially transformative for human society. I mean, we know that societies uh, where you have people who are better educated or smarter and more able to innovate themselves produce what economists call knowledge spillovers. What that means is that uh, if you live in a country with highly educated workers or intelligent workers, you benefit because they're producing more goods and services that are of value to you. So uh, let's say you know, half of all people in developed nations now die of heart disease, roughly, maybe it's 40%. Something like that. So those people, how are they helped by uh, some neurotechnology? Well, they're helped because the odds of someone developing a cure for that condition go up. The smarter we are, the more total brain power we have, the more effective brain power we have with this network together, the more discoveries of all sorts in science, engineering, and so on we're going to have to benefit everyone else. I think the empathy factor is a, a great point. Uh, in my novel, I have an example of one character who uh, is a soldier, an ex-soldier, who was abducted in a war uh, by the, the foes, foes that he was fighting, who used a, an empathy technology to show him their perspective. Uh, and now he's a campaigner for world peace. And that may or may not be realistic, but I do think the more that people empathize with other people, the less likely there is to be conflict. So. Who knows what we could accomplish if we could actually increase that level of mutual understanding. Lots of things. I mean, we should all be a little bit frightened, uh, and we should be watching out for misuses of things. Um, technology puts more power in individual hands, and mostly that is a very, very good thing. 
but it increases the power of individuals to harm or kill others. So I think that we do have to think about the risks of um, individuals doing things, for example, with biotech, being able to engineer a more dangerous pathogen that you could release. Uh, I would say there, as with uploading the brain, um, we don't really know how hard that would be. We can guess, but no one's done it so far. Uh, genetic engineering actually is quite complicated. Um, testing such a pathogen to see if it was actually effective would be quite, quite complicated, doing so in secrecy even more so. Uh, but it certainly is a potential increase in the ability of individuals to harm others. It's one thing an individual can use a gun. They can kill so many people at once. Um, building a nuclear bomb is actually very hard, as we see. There are centrifuges and uranium and so on. Um, engineering a pathogen is a much, much easier thing. So that's one example of kind of a uh, new asymmetric power to destroy, potentially. The one thing I'll say on that note is that uh, most mutations are not very viable. So the idea of an accidental creation of a very dangerous pathogen is pretty low because most ways you can change things make them less fit in the environment. Um, but still, it's, it's a new type of risk that we haven't really gotten used to handling yet. If you went out with the goal of taking an existing virus and making it more dangerous, um, there are ways you could do it. How dangerous it would become, we don't really know. But there are things that biologists know about how to increase incubation time, how to make a virus more transmissible, how to make viral particles you know, more hardy in the environment, that you could imagine doing those to an already very dangerous pathogen. Um, and so there's a real consideration there, a real concern there. Well, we can change a lot of things. And the, the biggest enemy in a lot of ways is not the risk of some horrific event. It's the kind of uh, humdrum everyday problems that we face. You know, we live in, in Western countries, we're relatively affluent. Uh, a billion and a half people, at least, still don't have electricity. Uh, two and a half billion people don't have toilets. Uh, it, the numbers are really staggering. 800 million people don't have food security. They sort of live meal to meal, if you will. That's what they can afford. So, you know, viral outbreaks and engineered pathogens sound very, very exciting, but the, the main purpose of technological advancement isn't necessarily to reduce the risk of those very bad events, but to handle a lot of very mundane badness that already happens in the world, in my mind. Mm -hmm.